Hey everybody, welcome back to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan. Uh, the last video that I put out was uh, somewhat for the creatives in our midst. This is definitely for the geeks. And I mean that in a most respectful way, of course. Today, I'm gonna to be answering the question that I get asked more than any other by a factor of 10. And that is, is this the right distance between these two elements in my uh, extreme macro setup? I get this asked all the time. And it's a good question because there's no really straightforward or simple answer. But I wanna go through this methodically today and explain to you what the general ideas are and then give you some, some specific uh, ways to, to set up your um, extreme macro rig so that you're getting the best results that you can. A couple of quick things. Thank you, as always, to my Patreon supporters. I really do appreciate your help. If you want to be as wonderful as those people, follow this link and it'll take you to my Patreon page where you can prove it. <laughs> Sorry, that, that was uncalled for. The other thing is this, macro photography involves a lot of unusual and weird gear. And all of us macro photographers end up buying stuff only to find out that it's not the right stuff or we upgrade, that type of thing. I've been thinking about putting a gear swap page on the Discord server where anybody who's looking for something or has something to swap or trade or sell or buy, that we could do that. Now, I don't know if it's legal, so I'll have to check into that. I haven't had a chance to yet. But if that sounds like it would be interesting to you, tell me in the, sh in the comments if you would. And if there's enough interest, I'll, I'll go ahead and set it up. All right, let's get down to business. We've got a lot to cover. So the question that I usually get is either a, a photograph or a description of a setup. And uh, the question is, do I have this, this component in the right place or not? And most of the confusion happens with uh, setting up infinity corrected objectives uh, and the various different kinds of tube lenses. And we will get into that. But that's definitely a little bit more complicated than setting up a finite objective. So we'll cover that one first because it's pretty straightforward. When you're setting up a finite objective, all you need is an extension tube. This is only part of an extension tube. The others are being used. An extension tube and your objective and a way to mount the two together. Most extension tubes come with a camera mount on one end and then a female bayonet on the other end so that you can just attach your lens, uh, your objective with an adapter. The distance is important as we talked about before. Finite objectives are designed to focus an image at a specific distance, at a finite distance. And it's usually marked on the objective, you can easily find it from the spec sheet if it isn't. And it is very important that you mount this objective at, the, at its rear element to your sensor that amount of distance. It's very common, uh, uh, the 4X objective we use has a, a 150 millimeter tube length. It actually has a 160 millimeter mechanical tube length. That's the 160 on the barrel, but it's actually 150 for the optical tube length, and that's the measurement you want to use. So you would mount this 150 millimeters from your sensor. To do that, you need to know the flange focal distance or the flange focus distance of your camera. Nikon's uh, DSLRs, have a flange focal distance of 46 and a half millimeters. So you just subtract the 46 and a half from the 150, and you need that 103 and a half 
uh, millimeters of extension tubes to put on the front, okay? What happens if you don't have the right uh, measurements, if you don't have the right length of extension, for example? It's important that you do with a finite objective because you have to remember that finite objectives, the ones that the ones that are designed with all of the chromatic and spherical aberration correction built into the objective are designed to be used at that tube length. If you move the tube length, for example, if you thought, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll move this forward and get some more magnification or I'll move it back and use it with less magnification. You could, but your aberrations are going to come back. And that's the problem with moving this. Your, your spherical and chromatic aberrations are taken care of by the objective only when it's set up at that 150 millimeter uh, optical tube length. Okay, so uh, that's another question I'm frequently asked is if I move this closer or further, can I change the magnification? The answer is yes. <clears throat> but your image quality will be so degraded, you'll wish you hadn't. Okay, that's really all there is to cover on finite objectives. Now we're going to talk about a much more complicated matter, which is the infinite objective. Now, there are two lengths that we concern ourselves with. The first is the, the, the length and the focal length of the tube lens. The second is the length of the infinity space or the afocal space. That is the space between your relay lens and your objective. So we're gonna, we're gonna break this down and talk about those distances with each of the different types of tube lens. A very quick refresher though. The objective gathers the light, either reflected or transmitted from your, from your subject, and it produces a parallel flux of light rays. And that flux of light rays travels through the afocal or infinity space, the empty space between the objective and the tube lens, before it is captured or gathered, I should say, by the tube lens and then focused onto your sensor. So you have to have both. And there are three different kinds of tube lenses that we use and each of them requires different considerations both for the uh, tube length and for the infinity space. So let's go through them starting with the microscope tube lens. It's important to remember that the objective and the tube lens work together in harmony. And for each setup of an objective and a tube lens, there are gonna be different considerations and the distances may be different. So let's pretend for a minute that this is a microscope. The, the way it has been designed is so that there is a big space between the tube lens and the objective. The reason for this space is because microscopists will frequently want to put additional optical components into this area where the light is traveling parallel and you can do things like add epifluorescent light sources or polarizers or filters, all manner of different things, DIC prisms, they can all be put into this space without impacting the image quality. This all came about back in, back in the 30s when Reichert, the uh, German uh, microscope company, was looking for a solution of how to add elements uh, in between the eyepiece and the objective. Back in those days, all they had were finite uh, objectives, and they couldn't do that without degrading or otherwise uh, interfering with the quality of, uh, of the uh, image through the eyepiece. And they came up with this whole infinity objective idea. Amazingly, it didn't catch on until like the 1980s. So what 
does this infinity space mean to a photographer? Well, first of all, we have to remember why it was constructed the way it was. Why does Nikon, for example, suggest that with this objective and the Nikon tube lens, an infinity space of between 70 and 150 millimeters? Well, that is because they, they have the objective and the tube lens tuned to operate at its peak at those distances. So we need to be aware of that. Even though we're not using this as a microscope, we're not going to be necessarily putting any elements into this light flux. We still need to bear in mind that this whole setup was designed to give the best image at those distances. So what do I mean by a, an objective and a tube lens being tuned or having a sweet spot for the infinity length? What I am actually saying is the entrance pupil of my tube lens matches the exit pupil of the objective. That is a very important concept. And let me explain what I mean by that and, and tell you why it's important. It's what limits the infinity space. Bad name for it because it's anything but infinite. It has a point at which you, you can go no further. And that is because as light enters this objective, if it's passing from the center of the subject, it's going to go right on through the system onto your sensor. And as the light leaves the objective, as I've said, it will be traveling parallel. But what about the light that is either reflected or transmitted from the edges of the subject? Well, we have to think about what happens to the light in an infinity objective when the light is not coming axially from in front of the objective. What happens is it travels through the infinity space because of the way the objective is made. Parallel, yes, but diagonal instead of straight. So the light that's coming from the edges of the subject does pass through the infinity space as parallel rays, as a flux, but it's at a flux on a diagonal, which means as this distance gets longer and longer, the infinity space, we reach a point where these diagonal light fluxes are not making it to the tube lens. And when that happens, the image circle starts to shrink and darken. So there is an absolute limit to how long the infinity space can be. Now, in practical use, there shouldn't be an absolute minimum distance, but oddly enough, there is, uh, depending on what kind of tube lens you're using. Generally speaking, if I'm using a microscope tube lens, I will, I will select a, uh, an infinity space that is as close to how uh, the microscope would be set up that this equipment would normally be used in, which means for this objective, I would probably, I would probably use an infinity space of around 50 millimeters. And, and that seems to be fine. That changes when we switch out our tube lens for a camera lens, and that's, that's going to be something we talk about in a minute. As far as the uh, other distance goes, the um, uh, tube lens of focal length 200, or in the case of a Raynox, 208 millimeters, generally speaking, it is recommended that you set it up at its focal length. Now, just like any time there's a rule in photography, somebody's figured out a way to break it. And uh, 
There is, a, there is another new concept that we haven't talked about before called short focusing. Now, this is actually set up as a short focusing rig right here because I'm using a Rainox DCR150, which has a focal length of 208 millimeters. So normally I would use this at 208 millimeters from the sensor. But I'm not doing that here. I have it set up at 150 millimeters from the sensor. Now, why in the world would I do that? Well, it turns out that some tube lenses, probably most tube lenses, are able to short focus by reducing the physical distance between the tube lens and the sensor. What we're doing is we're actually reducing the, the focal length of the lens, kind of. What we're doing is creating an effective focal length that's actually shorter than the, the focal length of the lens itself. In order to, to do that, the tube lens is actually focusing beyond infinity. Now, if it sounds to you like doing that should just mess everything up and result in a blob, uh, you're right, it should, but it doesn't. <laughs> I don't know who, who came up with short focusing. Uh, Robert O'Toole is the, the guy I first read about it from, who has written quite a bit on it. And I think he's tested every tube lens, every microscope objective, every cat litter box cleaner, and you name it, he's tested it. Um, and his site, uh, Close Up Photography, I've mentioned it before, uh, goes into quite a bit of detail. But it turns out that many of these tube lenses do actually have a performance boost when you use short focusing. But short focusing is an exception to the rule. You're always going to be safe if you set up your lens to operate at its focal distance, which is why I will tell you to use your Raynox DCR150 at a focal length of 208 millimeters, 208 millimeters from the lens back to the sensor. You will be safe doing that. But if you want to experiment with it, I think the actual sensor to Raynox distance uh, that uh, Robert came up with was 144 millimeters. Uh, that would mean having 144 millimeters between sensor and lens and a, uh, a, an infinity space of 50 millimeters as it happens. I think this is less important. You could probably get away with a little more, a little less. The issue with the diagonal light and the darkening at the edges probably wouldn't affect this setup until the space was way over 150, uh, 200 millimeters before you saw darkening, which gives me pause for um, a, a little digression. If you're going to get into trying different things with your microscope objective setups like this, I highly recommend you look into the kind of test platform that you're going to use. When we're testing a setup like this, what we're looking for are subtle changes, darkening, chromatic aberrations, spherical aberrations. What we need is something that is very detailed, something that is very flat as our subject so that we can, we can take what should be a corner to corner sharp image in one release of the shutter. In other words, we definitely don't want to be adding the complexity of focus stacking if we're trying to figure out how sharp this is because focus stacking adds all of its own uh, issues. If you look at the images that a lot of lens testers and objective testers use as a subject, you'll find incredibly detailed images of computer chips, silicone wafers, dyes, I think they're called. 
I've really never known how to get my hands on one. This weekend, I made it my business to learn where to find these things. And after several burns and a long day of shattering pieces of ceramic in my kitchen, I finally figured out how to open up these things. These are the things that, uh, none of these are good ones. I've figured out now what the good ones are. But these little ceramic packages that you see soldered onto circuit boards contain within them a tiny little chip of silicone. Looks like glass. And if you look at it uh, under a microscope, it will just blow you away. I mean, there are wires on that piece of silicone that are uh, sub-micron lengths, nanometers wide. Uh, so talking about absolutely flat, absolutely packed full of detail, these are the best things for testing. So what I've done to get a collection of these uh, fascinating uh, testing subjects is I went to the thrift shop and I bought a, a bunch of broken appliances, uh, printers and a couple of uh, music amplifiers and some other, other goodies. So when I brought the stuff home, I opened it up and dismantled everything and got out all the circuit boards and then took all of the processors out of the circuit boards just by blowing hot air, very hot air onto them and melts the solder and these come out. And then um, after watching a few videos, I figured out how to open these up and get out these minute, tiny little silicone chips. Uh, they're really hard to get out and uh, you'll, you'll break a lot more than you successfully get out. I'm getting better at it though. I super glue them onto these um, little squares of acrylic because they're milled flat. And this goes uh, onto my platform. Now, I've been using it on a mechanical rail. I recommend you do this if you're going to, to set up something like this to test your own setups that you actually put it on a manual rail. The, uh, the amount of vibration that you get from the automatic rail, even just positioning uh, the lens, it sets up terrible vibrations. And when you're trying to photograph these things, you really have to have absolute control of the environment because under, under high magnification, this just becomes a shiny blur. When you can get everything completely still, then you can take some incredible photographs. I'll show some of them to you here, but that is what I would recommend if you're gonna test a system yourself, fiddle around with using short focus or whatever, uh, figure out how to get these things out and um, safely without you know, burning the house down or whatever. And uh, if, if you want, if there's enough interest, I'll do a video on how you get these chips out. But uh, the photographs you're gonna be seeing are taken in the last couple of days by me from chips that I took out. I mounted them on other flat surfaces too. And uh, they work really well. Okay. Moving on. So we've talked now about the tube lens. So let's talk about the special case of the Raynox uh, close-up lens. I know you're, uh, you're all familiar with it. It actually functions very much like a tube lens for a microscope. And as such, it does allow you to have a pretty large infinity space. In fact, I've, oh, I don't have enough um, uh, extension tubes to test it beyond about um, 190 millimeters. It's, it's starting to, to get some pretty bad vignetting that far out, but uh, up to about 150, I couldn't, I couldn't see any degradation in quality. Now, of course, 
You don't expect to see any degradation in quality. That's the whole reason that the infinity corrected objective was invented, was so that you could adjust this space without any quality issues. What I have found, and it's it's been um, pretty disappointing in several shoots I've done uh, of late, and I know that this is going to be a little controversial, but when I position my objective right on top of the Rainox, as I have recommended to you on uh, several occasions, I get such bad internal reflections, which manifest as haze and complete loss of contrast. Everything just becomes mush. Um, and I have, I have tried my hardest to get rid of it by flocking everything, all the, the tubes internally. But it seems to me that once I get the, the objective back within about 20 millimeters of the front of the Rainox, I start getting these bad internal reflections. So I have gone to using a, a larger infinity space of about 50 millimeters. I get no internal reflections at that distance. And uh, there is, there's no problem with vignetting because I could go much further with the infinity space if I wanted to before that crept in. The reason I could go so far is because the Rainox has a well-matched um, entrance pupil it matches the exit pupil of the objective very nicely, which is not the case when we use telephoto lenses. Let's talk about them now because they really are a different case altogether. When we looked at the tube lens and we looked at the Rainox, we were really looking at the components of a microscope being used for photography, but still set up kind of like a microscope. That is not the case when we use a telephoto zoom. We're using this zoom lens or this telephoto lens to gather the parallel light rays leaving the objective and focus them onto our sensor. Now, theoretically, we could also place as much infinity space as we wanted up to the maximum, at which point we'd get vignetting, but do we need to do that? Do we need to add an infinity space? With the tube lens, we know from the microscope that this stuff was taken from that the entrance and exit pupil are well matched. But what about the entrance pupil of this lens? How does that match with the objective? Because that's really going to determine where you want to put your infinity space, how, how far in front of this lens do you want to put your objective to, guess, to get the best picture? Well, all you have to do is take a look at the entrance pupil of this lens to realize that they're not really very well matched. You can see that the entrance pupil in this lens is huge. And I don't know if the camera does it uh, justice, but it is way, way down inside the lens. The entrance pupil, by the way, if, if you're not familiar with it, is the aperture as viewed through the front element of the lens. Um, and it's important because matching the entrance pupil of the relay lens to the exit pupil of the objective determines how much infinity space you can or should use. And um, the point I'm making here is that we already have, it looks to me like we have about 150 millimeters of lens before we get to the entrance pupil, which is gigantic. Then it makes sense that a lot of us will mount this objective right on the end of the lens. And that's the way you've seen me use it. Well, just to make matters more complicated, I retested this lens uh, over the weekend 
and discovered that there is actually a good 50 or 60 millimeters that I can add to the distance from, uh, from objective to lens and still get a very sharp image with no chromatic aberration, no spherical aberration, no darkening and no vignetting, all the way out to about 50 millimeters. But when I move it back to right on top of the lens where I've used it historically, I once again get terrible internal uh, reflections and a dramatic loss in contrast and image quality. So understand that that is not characteristic of all 200 millimeter lenses. Whatever lens you're using and whatever infinity corrected objective you're using is going to give you different results. And I guess if there is one take home from this, there isn't, there are going to be two, but one of them would be to remember that every lens and objective combination is going to function differently. You may have a 200 millimeter lens that is short. It has uh, an entrance pupil right at the front of the lens and it's a small entrance pupil and it will play beautifully with this objective at two millimeters. Uh, or you may have one like this. So what I'd recommend is this, if you're planning to use a, a zoom, a telephoto anyway, a prime or a zoom, as your relay lens with a 10x objective. Set it up so that you can do some testing at different infinity lengths. You'll read that changing the infinity space doesn't affect the quality, the amount of aberrations, uh, the, yeah, the resolution. Basically, all of that stays the same. The only thing that you add is a convenient space to work in if you're a mic microscopist. But it turns out that there are other reasons you might want to consider moving this forward. And because of the way an infinity corrected objective works, you can. You don't have to, but you can. The other take home is kind of a general rule of thumb. When in doubt, Use the shortest infinity space you can get away with, with your zoom lens, that also gives you acceptable image quality. That's the key. If it means that with your particular 200 millimeter zoom lens, you have to uh, add 30 millimeters of infinity space, then go for it by all means, because if you're having internal reflections when you move it closer, you don't want that, that's poor image quality. If you have to have 100 millimeters of extension, uh, do that. So test your lens and see where, it, where the sweet spot is. See, what you, see where do you have to position the objective to match the, the pupils as well as you can. Uh, it is very much a matter of uh, trial and error and experimentation, which is why I strongly suggest you find a very, very stable platform to do these tests on, to make these uh, comparisons and, and measurements. Good lighting. I'm not a big fan of continuous lighting, but I did all of this photography to test out these various rigs on um, uh, continuous light, just to, uh, just to take out another variable of, uh, of changes in light intensity that you can get with flash. Another difference between the infinity corrected objective and a finite objective, and one that causes a little bit of confusion, is that there are ways that you can modify the tube lens in order to use this at different magnifications and get really nice pictures. One example is to use uh, a different tube lens with a shorter focal distance, like the uh, DCR250, uh, which is another Raynox lens. So the focal length of the DCR250 is only 125 millimeters, uh, 
If you place the DCR250 on the correct amount of extension to get you the 125 millimeters, you've changed the actual focal distance of your tube lens. And that will allow you to use this objective at around 5x. That is different from short focusing. In short focusing, you don't change the lens, you change the physical distance, and that creates uh, a, a different effective focal distance, which also reduces the amount of magnification. So one option is to, to use that kind of tube lens, a, a, a shorter focal length tube lens to get a lower magnification use out of the, the 10X objective. The camera lens is a bit of a wild card. If you're gonna use a camera lens, check it out carefully and see if you get improved quality uh, at a slightly longer infinity space. And, and whatever works for you, use it. Uh, you'll find if you go too far, you'll get vignetting. If you uh, like, if you're like me, if you put it right on the lens, you may have internal reflections. But find out what it is for your combination of objective and lens. I was just getting ready to say goodbye when it occurred to me that I hadn't even mentioned about sensor size. This is a, a place where sensor size is important. Uh, if you're using a full frame sensor, which I generally don't when I'm using a setup like this, um, be aware that uh, at longer uh, infinity spaces or longer a focal distances, you're going to end up with vignetting a lot earlier than if you're using a crop uh, or a micro four thirds. So bear that in mind. It, uh, it shouldn't make any practical difference. You should be able to get an, a very sharp image long before you get to, to those kind of distances, but just to be complete. All right, that's enough for one day. I hope it was useful and marginally interesting. If there's anything that you are interested in, if there's anything that I haven't covered that you'd like to hear about, please leave a comment or send me an email. You know how to reach me. And uh, I'm always looking for stuff uh, that may be interesting to you. So let me know if you can think of something. Several people have been making snide and uncalled for remarks about my lovely beard. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> I know it's hideous. I, I hate it. And it's, it's so itchy as well. But I'm not shaving it off. I'm thinking of letting it become so ugly that everybody wants me to shave it off and then I'll have a like a Patreon challenge. I really, really want to get a Thor Labs ITL 200. It's a, it's a lens I uh, traded in for another piece of equipment and uh, I wish I hadn't done that. So maybe that's what I'll do. If I can, if I can get enough funds to, to replace that ITL 200 or cut my beard off. In fact, if I can get enough money to get an ITL 200, I'll also throw in one of my hands. <laughs> All right, enough getting silly. I'll see you again in a few days. Take care, avoid getting sick out there. And uh, yeah, I'll see you again soon. Take care.